But he was aware of that as he slowly built his way through the different poses towards it. I mean, here he's got them in a little bit closer. In fact, you can just see here the, the effect of the soft focus uh, lens, mm -hmm. which he kept on there while shooting Mike. I think the point he made was that where two people are in the picture, it's perfectly valid to use the soft focus lens because it gives a kind of almost romantic sort of uh, air to it. But remembering that, that this is a soft focus attachment, this isn't having the picture out of focus, but just softening the oh, lines with an attachment. Very much, so, very much so. That's as crisp as blazes. That was a beautiful little shot. But here's one which now does make the point very solidly about which Patrick was talking, and that is all this ornamentation. Do you remember how the living room was full of vases and china elephants and so on and so forth? And Patrick did this one just to make the point that it's almost impossible to avoid bits and pieces uh, sticking out all over the place. But he was very much more concerned, I think, with the wallpaper. Yes, because the stuff that might be nice to live with is not necessarily going to work with a photograph, and you must be very careful with backgrounds. Just think of either use it or lose it, mm -hmm. and the sheet did just that. Mm -hmm. It lost so the, it wasn't just a piece of pure theatricality. He really was working at it there. And finally, of course, having gone through all this various building process and working towards the final picture, this is what he arrived at, and I do think it's a gem. Yes, the couple looks so very, very relaxed there, don't you think? Yes, very happy, very alive. Again, those highlights in the eyes. I think it's an absolute super picture. Mm -hmm. And here's one photographer who didn't need any boxes to stand his subject on, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the next programme, we're going to be taking a look at nature photography. Jo went out filming with Heather Angel, and amongst other pictures she took is this one of marsh marigolds showing the environment in which they grow. It's fascinating to watch Heather Angel at work, and I hope you'll join us next week. Till then, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>
Time is coming up to one o'clock on Monday the 14th of September 1981 and time to join Peter Griffins at ITN for news at one. This is the News at One from ITN with Peter Sissons. Hello, good afternoon. Mrs Thatcher's cabinet reshuffle is on and it looks as if a number of ministries will change hands later today. This morning, several cabinet ministers, including Mr James Pryor, saw the Prime Minister at number 10. We talked to a former colleague of Mr Pryor at the, at the Employment Department who's been through it all before, being sacked earlier this year. And as Mrs. Thatcher's difficulties with her administration grab the news, we hear how welcome that is to the Labour opposition. The other main news, a 17-year-old youth who fired shots near the Queen at the Trooping the Colour is sent to jail for five years. But first, Mrs. Thatcher's long-awaited cabinet reshuffle is on, but it looks as if we'll have to wait a little longer for the full details. There's been a regular series of comings and goings at number 10 Downing Street this morning. One of the first arrivals was the Employment Secretary, Mr Jim Pryor, who said vehemently that he wants to keep his job. When he left the Prime Minister, he was cryptic about his future. I'm still Employment Secretary, he said, but I'll still not be getting much work done today. He's expected to see Mrs Thatcher again later this afternoon. Another early arrival was the Northern Ireland Secretary, Mr Humphrey Atkins, who's been tipped to switch posts in the reshuffle. Next was the Transport Minister, Mr Norman Fowler, Another key figure in the Tory hierarchy to see the Prime Minister was Lord Soames, Lord President of the Council and Leader of the House of Lords. Well, as the speculation continues, our political editor has been monitoring events in Downing Street. This is Mrs Thatcher's second reshuffle since she became Prime Minister, and this time it's expected to be a bigger reconstruction of her government. She spent the weekend at Chequers, planning it in detail, consulting only her closest advisers, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Wyclaw was called in, and so was the Chief Whip, Mr Jopling. The whole of today is devoted to the long process of seeing all those ministers involved uh, in promotion or demotion, and the results may not be known until later today. The long build-up to this reshuffle has intensified the expectations and anxieties among ministers. Mr Pryor's public statement that he did not want to be moved from the uh, employment department was an indication that the so-called wets in the cabinet feared they were about to be weakened. Mr Pryor, along with another leading wet, Sir Ian Gilmore, got the summons this morning. They now look to be at the centre of this reshuffle. And judging from others who've crossed the doorstep at number 10, Mr Humphrey Atkins looks set to be recalled from Northern Ireland, Lord Soames looks like losing the Lord Presidency of the Council, and Mr Mark Carlyle, Education Secretary, may be replaced by his deputy, the Baroness Young. Among others who look set for promotion are Mr Norman Fowler, Transport Minister, uh, the Industry Minister, Mr Norman Tebbit, and Mr Nigel Lawson, currently number three at the Treasury. Well, when the Cabinet uh, holds its next meeting tomorrow morning here at number 10 Downing Street, the faces round the table may look very different indeed. Bill Mathias, News at 1, Downing Street. With me now is Jim Lester, MP, a former colleague of Mr Pryor at the Employment Department, where he was Parliamentary Under Secretary. Mr Lester was one of three non-Cabinet Ministers axed in Mrs Thatcher's first reshuffle last January. That's when Mr Francis Pym was moved out of the Defence Department and Mr Norman St John Stevens lost his job as Leader of the House. Mr Lester, first of all, do you think it's politically possible for Mrs Thatcher to see Mr Pryor go to the back benches? I would have thought it was very foolish if she did, not only, of course, because of his broad experience in government and the amount of support he has in industry and his knowledge of industry, which is very important to the government, uh, but also the fact that he's a formidable figure in terms of support in the House amongst backbenchers and uh, that uh, if uh, the reshuffle goes a particular way, it would be a natural uh, leader for, uh, for the dissident toys on the backbenchers. What do you expect to happen? I would expect, as one always does in these things, for uh, political sense to come through. 
And I think that through today's discussions, uh, I think I heard Mr. Pryor when he came out saying that he had a very friendly discussion with the Prime Minister, uh, things were understood. And I suspect that at the end of the day, uh, the Prime Minister's own political judgment is sound enough to ensure that Jim Pryor is still doing a very useful job. Do you think the backbenchers would wear a purge of other wets like Sir Ian Gilmore? Well, I think it just depends. It depends on how wide the reconstruction is. Normally these things are balanced and there's promotions from either side and so on. And I think it's when you see the whole package that you make individual judgment and uh, then you accept it or not. It's if you get the balance changing, that's when you start to see uh, things get more difficult.